Hi, and welcome to my podcast, Jack to the Future. From science and inventions to pollution and recycling, I talk about what's changing in the world, the future, and how we can help with that. Every month I'll talk about a different future theme. For example, the future of science, tech, sustainability, reading, music and all sorts of other ones. The future of everything. Did you know? You can find me on Facebook and Instagram as Jade to the Future and on YouTube as Jack to the Future. Follow me to get behind the scenes info, access to the previews about my next episodes and much, much more. This week's episode is about the future of radio. I have my special guest, John O'Godley, director of Unite Radio, which is a fairly new radio station based in Hertfordshire in the UK. I talked to John about current listening trends among people of different ages, the ways in which people listen and how this has changed. And we go on to discuss how things could change in the world of radio and how technology may influence radio in the future. Just to apologise in advance, if you saw our social media post a few weeks ago, we had to record this episode in an um, unusual place. Yep, it was the bathroom because of some bang going on in our neighbour's house. Despite our best efforts, you can still hear some random sounds that were captured in the recording, so sorry about that. Time for some science. Radio waves are a type of radiation, and radiation is energy that moves. Like all waves of radiation, radio waves have something called frequency, and frequency describes the number of waves that pass a given point each second. You may have seen pictures of sound waves that all look like lumpy mountains. Yep, that's them. Radio waves are sent out by a device called a transmitter with an antenna. The transmitter tends to talking music or other information into electric signals. A radio picks up those waves and turns the electrical signal back into the original sounds for your speakers. Pretty cool, right? Each radio station sends out radio waves of a certain frequency and you have to find a certain number, for example, 100.98. And if you're looking for a radio station, yeah, that would be your radio stations. But that's kind of hard because there'd be loads and loads and loads of radio stations to look through. You get AM and FM radio stations, but there are only a limited number of stations available because the frequencies can't overlap and interfere with each other. Have you ever heard that stuff? noise like kissing on the radio. That's when you've come out of a frequency, so not the exact radio station frequency number that you need. DAB is digital radio. DAB stands for Digital Audio Broadcasting. It's easier because it's basically multiple programs can be on one frequency. The same signal can be sent out several times from the transmitter. This means that your radio is more likely to be able to pick up a signal and you don't have to remember the frequency number of the radio station you want to listen to. You can just click through it. A bit like you do when you watch the TV and the screen will tell you which station you're listening to. In order to talk about the future of radio, as radio has been a form of entertainment for so long, I think we need to travel back in time for a minute. Yes, Jack to the past. My friend said that could be a sequel podcast of mine. <laughs> Maybe. I think it's important to talk how old radio is and exactly what it is. Radio was the main entertainment at home till about 1955, and then television became more popular. You may not know this. On the 15th of June, 1920, the first wireless radio broadcast took place. An Italian scientist named Mark Coney first experimented with the first live radio broadcast that went out to the whole world. The first song that was played was by a lady called Dane Nelly Melba. She was an Australian opera singer with a very high voice. She even has a pudding name after her, the Peach Melba, which is peaches with raspberry sauce and ice cream. Yum. Anyway, back to the podcast. (laughs) So we're not usually allowed to play music because of the copyright laws, but this is just an old piece of music. It's allowed to be played. So here she is, a clip of Dame Nellie Melba singing Home Sweet Home for the first live radio broadcast in 1920. Wow, that 
that's impressive. But did you hear how crackly the sound was? We are so lucky we have to clear this out nowadays. It's fair to say that a lot has happened in radio since then. So, the future of radio. Hmm. To be honest, the only time I've listened to radio really is when I'm in the car. Apart from that, I don't really listen to radio. I tend to stream music and a player on a beaker at home. And when I was doing research for this podcast, that's what most other young people do too. I think that the reason why children and teenagers don't really listen to radio stations is because usually I like things where they're at the same age as me and appreciate the same things. So I generally just think it's more about what the child actually likes. If an old grown-up who did a radio show, I don't think much children at all would have listened to it. So, what do you think? Is there a future for radio? What do radio stations need to do to invite young people like me to go and listen to it? So I think the future of radio is that they need to get younger broadcasters for children. I think that would be a better sort of thing, so I think that might be a good future for radio. This week, I'm joined by John O'Godley, director at Unite Radio, a community-based radio station. Hi, John O. Thanks for being here. No problem at all. Great to be here. Thank you. You're a community radio station. What does that mean? So generally, what that kind of means is that we're here to support the community, all aspects of the local community. So for us specifically, we're supporting East Hertfordshire. And as we do a lot of different things, the first thing is really offering broadcasting opportunities to locals in the area, an opportunity or a chance to do a music show or a talk show on whatever it may be. So if someone has a specific genre of music that they like, we can work with them to get that up on air. Generally, we're also trying to go down the route of supporting local musicians and bands from the area as well and giving them some airplay there. I have a friend called Emma Morgan and you're actually giving her the chance for her to have her own radio show. That's really cool. I haven't listened to it, but she does a garage show at the weekends and Mum said it sounds really fun and, yeah... I can't wait to listen to it. Is there anything else that you do? So the broadcasting opportunity, that's really just one part of it. We're also offering marketing opportunities. So within that graphic design, a bit of journalism, content creation. So that could be video editing, audio editing, stuff like that. So it's quite wide ranging. Yeah, so just offering those types of creative opportunities to locals. And then last but not least, uh, one of the main things is just about supporting local businesses, organizations and charities in the area and we're really trying to create partnerships with them where we can offer them stuff and we can just help them out with spreading the word and it's the same with charities because we really want to do our bit and I've always thought when I was growing up there was always a big emphasis on doing something to kind of give back to the community and I had a bit of a brainwave last year towards the beginning of 2021 and I thought well I like radio and you can create a community interest company and set it up as a radio station. So to me, that was a no brainer, kind of combining the radio side of things with the ability to really give back to the community. Yeah, that's really it in a nutshell. That's what inspired me to launch Unite. Well, yes, I was gonna say Unite is obviously bringing people together. So like you said, you interview loads of people like bands, the music and shopping, and then you bring them all together to do a radio show with them. So yeah, I think that's a really great idea of how you started it. Yeah, and we've had a lot of support, like I said earlier, from the businesses and just at the moment, well, we're actually presenting every week a weekly radio show with the Brothership Studio in Hartford on the Bull Plain. So every Friday evening from seven, we go live with Nick, Nick Shipton, who actually runs the Brotherhood, and then Tracy Power, uh, one of the kind of resident uh, in-house artists there as well. Oh, yeah, that's the one I was talking about with Emma. So that has really helped, you know, in terms of building up a partnership with the Brothership, but also promoting them. And then in return, Unite's getting some awareness from it as well. So it's a win-win, really. Yeah. So obviously you've interviewed them and they're really, really nice. Nick Shipton mm. and Tracy. Tracy Power. Yeah. Yes. Because we went to the Brothership Studios. Their paintings are really, really good and yes. 
yeah. yeah yeah their drawing skills are amazing definitely yeah and they're generally it's really a quite a nice partnership to have yeah. because they support all aspects of the community they've interviewed a lot of artists and a lot of people in the local area and what's quite nice with the show we do with them specifically people can come along to the studio and watch us presenting it live and if they're up for you know coming on the microphone and having a little chat then that's quite nice and I think what makes it tempting for members of the public is that it's quite laid back people are just able to come along and get involved and enjoy themselves and it's not a really structured thing I think that makes a real difference yeah I know what you mean it does make less scary for people and then in terms of speaking more generally and the interviews that not just myself but my whole team have carried out in the past right up from when we launched we were fortunate enough to interview Bob Deering the mayor of Hartford and quite a few others from the local area as well a few mus- musicians and bands which was a great start and from that point onwards we've been working with one or two local businesses in the area a business called Celebrating ADHD run by a really nice lady called Sue Hart who essentially she has ADHD herself and We've been working together to talk to a lot of people who are specialised in the field, most of neurodiversity. So I know a lot about things like dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, all sorts of different neurodiverse conditions. So we've been able to do a lot of interviews there as well. So generally, we've we've got quite a lot of good content that's either already been released or is in the process of being put together at the moment. Yes. So. I didn't actually know what ADHD meant, so I looked up and it stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. I think it's really nice that you're interviewing people who have things like ADHD because yeah. see how they feel and you know sure. just help to... Um, I think that's the yeah. thing. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, myself... Specifically, I have ADHD, but I suppose over the course of the last year, with the help I've received from celebrating ADHD and also interviewing a lot of people who either know a lot about it or have it themselves, it's helped a lot to reframe it and view it in a much more positive light. With me specifically linking this into the radio, because radio is something, it's my passion, I love doing it, with people with ADD or ADHD, when they find something that they're super passionate about, they can literally spend ages doing it and never lose that momentum. I think the actual term for it is hyper-focus, literally just being able to really zone in on something and just block everything else out. And for me, with the radio specifically, I feel like due to that, I've been able to make a lot of progress with the everyday running of Unite just because of the ADHD. So, you know, there are definitely positives to it. Yes. So so I just wanted to say, what kind of ADHD do you have? So I've got ADD, so I don't have the hyperactivity at all. It's more for me to do with executive memory, so retaining information. For instance, if I was in a classroom, I've got dyspraxia, uh, dyscalculia as well. So essentially that links to struggling to remember certain bits of information and getting it down almost onto bits of paper because it has to obviously go into my brain and then I have to try and get it down on a bit of paper. Mm. So that ADD helped because yeah. it was only into the thing the other way. Mm-hmm. We read an article online that said that 90% of adults listen to the radio for about three hours a day, often in their cars. But younger people tend to stream music instead. Do you think there is a future for live radio? I hope, yes. I hope, I hope there is. I definitely think there is a future for live radio. I think specifically in terms of reaching younger audiences, it's about making it more accessible. So you mentioned the fact that younger people tend to stream music. I think what needs to happen moving forward with radio, and certain radio stations are already doing this, is for them to essentially take the content that they may have put out live on the radio and repurpose it, say, in the form of a podcast or something that people can stream on the go. Stations like the BBC Radio 1, Radio 2, quite a lot of them are already doing this. So taking kind of the best bits, say, of radio shows and reformatting them into half an hour podcasts that then get released on Spotify or Apple Music, things like that. So definitely, I think there is a future, but it comes down to making it as accessible as possible by using the wide variety of streaming apps that are out there these days. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. There's a fun radio station for kids called Fun Kids with stories and science and music. 
it's good because it's more what kids are interested in and sort of adjusted so we can understand if you know what I mean. I have friends that are older than me, they're like 10 or 12 and they listen to some particular radios so yeah I think they're already trying to do that to get children and people in their teens interested with radio so yeah I think that's a really good thing. Cool. Especially yeah. Bernie, that was very child friendly, yeah. Just if you didn't know who Bernie was, I used to do a radio show with him and he was really, really nice. He was he was really, really good at sharing ideas and having fun and, yeah, everything really. So, yeah, there, there are some really, really good ones for children and teens out there. Mm, for sure. <laughs> Have you noticed any differences in the way people listen to the radio? Yes, I have. I'd say that what we can do with the system we use to broadcast shows is we can essentially look at two things. The first thing is who's listening in there and then. So say if it is 5pm on a Monday evening, we can actually see who's tuned in, where they're tuned in from and what they're using to listen in, say a phone, a laptop, a tablet, whatever it may be. And generally, I've noticed that a lot of our listeners tend to use mobile devices such as phones or tablets to tune in. I, th- I kind of knew that anyway, but that's almost confirmed the fact that a lot of people will use mobile devices. So it's important to target those users and to make it as accessible as possible. So whether it's by having an app or something that people can use literally just to tap in as easily as possible. But mobile is definitely kind of the market almost that we need to target to move forward. Yeah, I think so on their computers and iPads and phones, they usually yeah. through like Alexa. Yeah, they listen through it, things like like that. I'd say so, definitely, mainly just due to how easy it is to tune into radio stations, specifically on smart speakers. We have got a Alexa skill for Unite Radio, and the way it works is you have to download the Alexa app on your iPhone or Android, and then you have to essentially search for the Unite Radio skill and enable it. And then what you can do, if you want to listen into Unite Radio at any time, you just have to say to Alexa, luckily I haven't got one in here at this point in time because otherwise she'd start playing the radio. Um, but you have to just say, Alexa, play Unite Radio. And if you've got the skill for the radio station enabled, she will then do that for you. So that's kind of one way for people to listen in. There are quite a few ways, though. Our website is kind of the main place we direct people to. UniteRadio.co.uk is the place to go. And literally on the home page there is a big play button that will tune people into the stream directly. And then we're working on kind of increasing the web presence of Unite Radio itself and the listening in options. The other thing that people can do, and this is, you know, for us to really target, like we were saying, the the mobile side of things, is there's an app called Streamer, so S-T-R-E-E-M-A, on both iOS and Android app stores. Um, And if people just download that, and type in Unite Radio, they can find us on there as well. So generally, there's quite a few different places people can go to to listen into the radio itself. Can I listen whenever I want, or is it only live? We press the play, but would it have been live or not? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So so we are live 24-7. So when there isn't a presenter on air, it will be back-to-back music. What we're doing at the moment is we're working on, with all of the current presenters we've got on the station itself, we record every single one of their shows to then put out on a service called Mixcloud, which is essentially a listen-back service so that anyone can go. They can listen back whenever they would like. Mm-hmm. Thanks for that. But what we're aiming to do, and this is kind of in the process at the moment, is say if you were to tune in at a certain time, you would hear a specific type of music. So we're almost essentially curating playlists of different types of music so that there's something for everyone. So if you were to tune in at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, you might hear top 40 pop music. Whereas if you were to tune in at 8 p.m. on a Sunday evening, you might hear kind of more laid back stuff. So we're trying to just naturally segue from genre to genre as best as possible yeah. so the time of the day it's like different sort of songs yeah they might play just getting ready for the day sort of music yeah. 
And then in yeah. the evening, yeah, like you said, laid back music. Yeah, I think for us, it all it all comes down to the statistics and who's listening in at certain times. So, for instance, the model that's generally followed with radio stations is if people doing like the drive time slot. People may want to hear upbeat kind of happy music. This not necessarily be the case for Unite. But I'm just thinking as a rule of thumb, this is usually what happens. You know, there's almost a repeating pattern. So say, you know, from 4 to 6 p.m. every Wednesday evening, which is usually the drive time slot. If people are tuning in regularly every week at that same time and listening to the music that's playing, we would be able to determine that they're liking something that's going on on air at that point in time. And we can work to really solidify and improve that as best as possible. Yeah. What does on air actually mean? It comes down to airwaves, radio airwaves. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The sound is carried by invisible sound waves. We read that voice control to listen to the radio might develop in the future. A little bit like talking to your headphones or car about what you want to hear. I want to play, you know, radio and maybe other appliances you may use, like any electronic device, you might ask your oven to put on <laughs> music. They might do that and you'd say to the oven, I want to put on blah, 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 evening music by that radio show. Um, yeah. <laughs> We also read about 3D sound to create a more immersive experience. So they invented something in 2013 where you basically could get this remote and then you put it on your tongue and it would zap your tongue to the taste of what you wanted to eat or smells. Uh, So we could add that to it maybe. And Mm. so if it played a certain song on the radio, like from Katy Perry, the song Fireworks, yeah, so Fireworks, and then you could actually see and hear Fireworks or by Jack Johnson, Banana Pancakes. (laughs) That'd be good to taste pancakes while you're listening to the song. Have you heard of any other technology which might be exciting? Yes, so there's quite a few different bits of tech that I think would really, specifically for the world of radio, be really useful and and beneficial. I would love to see an oven or a toaster that plays radio. I hope that someone can design that at some point soon, because that would be amazing. But sadly, that doesn't seem to be a thing yet. But in terms of technologies for radio specifically, there's quite a few things. The system we're using to broadcast shows, it's called radio.co. And keep it simple, in the past, what's happened when someone's wanted to set up a radio station, it's been pretty complicated because you've had to have loads of different elements that you'd have to then put together to actually build a radio station. But with the system we're using, it's essentially all in one. So it's rolled all the different aspects and elements into one, which makes it super easy to actually set up a radio station. So there's that. I'd say that also live video streaming is something that to a certain degree is already being done. But I think we'll only get bigger as time goes by. So, for instance, if someone's doing a radio show and they want to have a a visual element to it as well, as long as there isn't music necessarily playing on the video stream, that's something that's pretty good as well. You've just got to make sure to be careful about not breaching copyright when it comes to playing music. Yeah, we have to be careful about that when we do our podcast too. Streaming certain shows on YouTube, say if it's a talk yeah. show, you can definitely do that. And it's a good way to get people involved and to make it as interactive as possible because you have things like live chats, stuff like that. Call-in features and texting features, again, this is something that's already being done. I think we'll only, certainly with Unite, we're going to be using that a lot more moving forward. We'd have to filter it first, filter call-ins, but allowing people to ring up and maybe request a track or just have a chat with us about something that they've been up to or to get involved with, say, we're running a competition or a quiz. They can call into the studio. Same with texting features as well with an answer to a question That's definitely something as well. Specifically with our broadcast system, we're working on getting this feature up and running where essentially what people can do during certain request shows that we're going to introduce moving forward, people will be able to say, oh, you know, I want to hear this track and put in a request. We will then receive it on our end and we can then play that track for them. And that's all done online through the internet. Yeah, so I'd say the only other thing that really comes to mind in terms of technology improvements, you mentioned, you know, 3D audio, 3D sound, and this is generally more down the route of 
streaming services. So I know that Apple Music, what they've done is whenever you listen to a track on their streaming service, instead of it sounding like it's just going into both of your ears, it sounds like the music is actually surrounding you completely. Yeah. They teamed up with a company, I think it's Atmos. Atmos a- Toby. Yeah. It's called Spatial Audio. That's one of the things that is super exciting. And I'm hoping that at some point it's made more accessible so that radio stations are able to utilise that as well. Yeah, you know you think you were saying about where you could actually hear it in your ears? I got this cool thing that Dad found, and it was 8D, and basically you could hear the noises in the background, not, not just hear it, but when you put like these headphones on, and then you could hear in the background it coming nearer to you. Yeah. It's really cool. It's like you're a barber's shop. I've heard it, the virtual barber shop. Yeah. yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. Also, when you said about when people actually like to see things, like see the people actually doing the radio and what how they're actually doing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you can see it on YouTube, yeah, there's definitely good things about that. Also, there's live videos. And yeah. if you go onto that YouTube Q Night Radio, there's a newest videos button on the yeah. newest, if you scroll down. Yeah, and I think that's ultimately one of our aims is, so when we do start live streaming video content on YouTube, in addition to having the live video itself, Uh, When it goes out, we also will then be able to repurpose it. So take maybe a 10 minute segment from a live video and then edit it together and put it back on YouTube as a video that people can watch at any time. What happens when you live stream a video on YouTube is once that live stream is finished, YouTube then saves that stream so people can go back and watch the entire thing. There's a lot of exciting stuff that can be done, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. There's a video by the Buggles. Hmm. And it was a music video that you could watch and also a song. Yeah. It's called Video Killed the Radio Star. You may have seen on my social media, I played that song. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's basically about what it says in the name. What we were talking about, how the future of radio much has become video. Obviously, hopefully not. I don't know if you've heard of that song. Um, I have. Yeah. yeah. Is that still radio, do you think? I'd say, yeah. I mean, I think radio generally has got to adapt to keep up like a lot of things. So there will always be a space for radio. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. But I think in order for all radio stations to keep up with the ever-changing, I guess you could say, climate of radio itself and, you know, all the other platforms that people could use, I think it is just a matter of, making it more accessible and adapting it so it fits in with the other platforms such as Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube and kind of the on-demand things as well. I think in order for radio to really stay afloat, it needs to harness those technologies, which is what so many stations are doing these days. Radio One comes to mind. They are really doing so much to make sure that their content is available outside of what is on air on their station and are making sure that it's available on demand. I think for radio to really stay current and to keep up with the changing technologies and stuff, that is what they need to do. Yeah, yeah, I definitely do agree. Yeah, so because of technology, you don't necessarily need like a recording studio anymore, do you? Definitely, I think, much more accessible now than it was in the past. But I would also say that there's something super exciting about doing a show live from a studio. So I'd say, again, with the broadcast system that we're using, it's very easy. So presenters have two options when it comes to their shows. They can either, as long as they have a Wi-Fi connection, broadcast live from home, you know, at the same time every week. Or the other option is similar to what we're doing now for them to pre-record their show edit it all together and then send it over to us. And we would say, right, well, your show's happening at 4 p.m. on a Wednesday every week. So it needs to be scheduled in for that time. So once we've received their show, we would then sort the rest. And at that specific time on a Wednesday, that show would go out. You know, radio doesn't have one at the moment, do you? This will be in the future. We're uh, aiming to actually secure a studio space and allow people to come along and do their shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. I haven't been. Not yet, I won't. When I'm old, I might. So it might be quite exciting, yeah. Have you got any recommendations of what or when I should listen to Unite Radio? My favourite is usually 
it's sort of rock. I mean... But with things with guitar in. Okay. So, I mean, this is going to sound like a huge plug on my end. Uh, if rock is your thing, my show, Takeover Tuesdays, which happens from 7 through to 9 p.m., I play a lot of rock during that show. It's kind of more alternative, but also there's a bit of classic rock in there. I kind of tried to involve a lot of different types of rock so that all audiences yeah. can enjoy it. So I'd say... Without sounding like I'm plugging my own show, that's a good place to start. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. For different like types of rock, because obviously, you know, everybody's different. So yeah, it's good that you do different types, not just one sort of theme. I mean, that's what mm. all radios do, but yeah, it's, it's good yeah. that radios have different genres of the genres. Yeah, I think that's the thing. And I think for me, with my show specifically, but also all of the shows on Unite, the listener interaction is a massive part of it. So hearing back from people about what they would like to hear or getting requests from them so that we can really cater it to their interests and their tastes as much as possible. Because it comes back to we are a community radio station. Everything that we're doing is to support the community. And that could be anything from, like I said earlier, supporting businesses to simply just playing music that people like or having topics of conversation on certain shows that people have an interest in. But the interactivity generally overall is so important because that way we can hear back from people, we can find out about their interests, and then we can create content based on that. Obviously, being a new station, we're still trying to gather up all that data at the moment. But moving forward over the next kind of six months to a year, say, we want to really work on that so that when people tune in, they hear stuff they're interested in. They study, if you like, on what people like and what they would like to hear on the radio. Mm, Thanks. That makes sense to me. It'll be more popular if you play things that people want to hear, especially if it's a radio station for them. I really enjoyed talking to you today, Jono, and my favourite thing that we talked about was definitely the second question, Mm. um, when we talked about the, the future of live radio, that one. Yeah, yeah, the future of live radio about younger people that usually stream things. And so I would say thanks for being here. Yeah, well, thank you. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. And obviously, as Unite Radio, I'm looking forward to working together moving forward. And stay tuned. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I'm definitely going to listen to your, your rock show because I bet it'll be amazing. Oh, that's very kind. I'll make sure to shoot you a link to one of the best ones. Thank you. No worries at all. Bye. Bye-bye. I've really enjoyed this episode and learnt a lot. Mum will put the link to Unite's website in this podcast description and you can also follow them on Facebook and Instagram. We read an article on a website called Radio King. It actually said, despite the amount of streaming services, the most popular way that people find out about new music is still through the radio. So I don't think in the future the radio is going to end. And so like Jono said, he and I just think it's just going to change. I think they're going to make it more modern so people will be more interested and people are always going to listen to music and that's never going to go away. So I hope that in the future, more technologies will become cheaper because like we said in the podcast, New Night Radio and other radios might use it to develop their broadcasting in a different way. Radio has been around for a really long time and even though developing new technologies and more are coming out, even in the 1940s and 50s when they had televisions, they predicted that radio broadcasting would end, but it definitely hasn't yet. It's been around for a really long time and hopefully it will keep on lasting until the, into the future. Join me next time for another exciting episode of Jack of the Future.